What's up, Action Tribe? AJ here, host and founder of My Seven Chakras, my7chakras.com, the show where we help you calm your mind, relax your nervous system, and help you experience loads of bliss. In today's episode, we talk about some really amazing, powerful topics, such as understanding the different body types and which one you might be part of, self care daily routines, and the science and evidence behind Ayurveda. So it's going to be a really interesting session. If you'd like to explore evidence based, science backed topics like these, breath work, yoga, Ayurveda, mindfulness, then make sure that you hit the subscribe button on your iPhone. If you're on Spotify, then make sure you hit the follow button. And if you prefer watching these sessions and watch our faces, then make sure you go to YouTube because we stream all our sessions on YouTube as well. And we're building out a library. Visit my 7 forward slash YouTube. That's my 7 forward slash YouTube and hit subscribe and the bell notification icon because that does something to the algorithm, helps us be in front of more ears and eyes. Right? So I spend over 35 hours to get you these sessions. And all I'm asking for is a subscribe. So I hope you can help us out. Uh, and make sure that you listen till the very end because I've reserved the juicy questions from today's you know, special episode at the very end. So, so stay tuned. Um, with that being said, let's bring on our special guest for today, who is Vaidya Minakshi Gupta, who is a master in Ayurveda, gold medalist, Panchakarma specialist, certified in nutrition science and child nutrition. And she is an internationally renowned Ayurveda expert, classically trained Vaidya, holistic practitioner, founder, and CEO of Ayur roots Ayurveda wellness in the Dallas area. Now, as many of you know that I'm a breathwork instructor. So in addition to breathwork techniques and guided meditations, I also want to bring you some information about other Indic sciences like Ayurveda and Tantra and Vedanta and much more. And Ayurveda is so vast that there's always something that you and me and we can learn. So Thanks for joining us, Manakshi. How's it going? Thank you so much. Great to be here. Wonderful. Yeah, so as you might know, I am really fascinated by Ayurveda and what research and evidence is showing about these ancient practices that a lot of Indians have been practicing for many years back, right? So I want to explore Ayurveda, but I was hoping to start from the beginning. So where did you grow up? And what was your childhood like? Uh, I grew up in India and uh, my childhood was in a very small city of India, Northern India, um, basically from Punjab and uh, belonged to the army family and the holistic family, I would say that. So started the Ayurveda journey from very beginning of my childhood with my mom and my grandma who used to make some uh, uh, herbal uh, concoctions um, and uh, mom was into homeopathy. So both the pathies, Ayurveda as well as the homeopathy, I grew up with both of the, uh, 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 the sciences. And uh, that actually helped me in deciding where, which path I want to uh, go into. Interesting. So speaking of paths, when you were a kid, what did you want to become when you grew up? So I was very clear about that. I wanted to become a doctor only. And yeah. the only thing was um, that I uh, was not sure if I wanted to become a Western doctor or Ayurvedic doctor. Um, I chose to become an Ayurveda doctor because uh, as a kid, I was not a healthy kid. So homeopathy, unfortunately, never worked for me. So the mom used to take me to the one of the, uh, interestingly, to the Ayurveda Vaidya. Vaidya yeah. means with a physician and uh, there I started the um, Ayurveda journey and one day or two days of the medicine and I used to feel healthy so in that way I thought that okay I wanted to become an Ayurveda doctor so very clear in my mind that uh, I want to opt for the holistic science only interesting so as a kid what sort of issues did you have that you know, uh, Western medicine was not able to solve, but then Ayurveda was able to help you. 
so as a child um, unfortunately i got the whooping cough and that time um, the respiratory system was very it after that it got very weak what i heard from my mom that even i was not able to walk at the age of 3 years so um, after that whenever there is a seasonal change or if there is a i am under little bit of stress because of the studies and all so my uh, bronchitis used to be very bad so once i hit the path where i felt that okay uh, i should not do this i should not eating yogurt because yogurt is making my throat goes really bad for months and once i learned that and then i got more interested into that okay what is in that that why the food is so important because ayurveda uh, we say that uh, uh, whole ayurveda is based upon the three uh, pillars which is ahar nidra brahmacharya ahar means the diet and diet is the foremost part of the ayurveda principles so then once i learned that then i started exploring more why this food is not good for me why mm. that food uh, make me feel better and that's how i started incorporating uh, slowly slowly in my life on daily basis interesting so you have food then the nidra is sleep right nidra is sleep and brahma and- is uh, uh, control use of senses okay so we we normally over indulge in the social media or listening talking too much so all the senses when we do the over indulgence that also creates the imbalance so that's all ayurveda is about ahar nidra brahmacharya that's great i didn't know that so that's very interesting so it's like diet and sleep and avoidance of over indulgence or over stimulation of our senses because it's true it can take a toll on our emotions and our thoughts and our overall energy and so that's what ayurveda is all about um talk to us a bit about the history of ayurveda now and india's contribution to this science and and to the world so ayurveda is a 5000 old year science uh, started from the vedic culture so um if we say that the three books main books of ayurveda uh, charak sushruta and ashtang charak is uh, mostly related to the uh, we say that ayurvedic medicines and the principles of ayurveda and sushruta is more related towards the surgery aspect and uh, where uh, uh, more uh, um, surgical instruments how to perform even the plastic surgery we say that the origin of the plastic surgery started from the sushruta only and uh, even in the sushruta uh, the main instrument for the surgery is the hand because without hand you cannot hold uh, any instrument so that was also explained in uh, sushruta then the third one was the ashtanga ashtanga divided into two like ashtanga hridayam and ashtanga sangra so these three major um, i would say the uh, books of ayurveda where uh, the principles of the ayurveda has given in a different format so ayurveda is just like an ocean so various uh, uh, principles are given by but the main message is always like um swasthasya swastharakshanam aturasya vikara prashmanam cha means swasthasya means uh, who is healthy they need to preserve the health and who is not healthy they need to build up the health mm. yeah one thing that's really amazing about ayurveda is that it's not about sick care you know it's not about waiting till you get sick and then you know taking measures which is good to do but it's about prevention rather than cure right it's about being proactive and realizing that the absence of sickness or illness is not health right health True. is uh, completely abundance I- and vitality of energy true and uh, it's it's uh, it's interesting to see how ayurveda is evolving these days because i remember when i started my practice 20 years ago it was really tough because uh, um, there was not a major awareness uh, you talk you asked about the ayush how the um, indian government is doing so ayush is the department which is seeing the ayurveda globally hmm so when i started my journey it was never a smooth journey and sure. i feel that uh, the smooth linear path of evolution always happens in the 
mathematical hypothesis or in the dreams mm. so that journey was uh, kind of like composed uh, of cliffs uh, there was a surprise pitfalls also as yep. i said lack of proper awareness was a major challenge and mm. i was still unknown to uh, most of the people in the western world um including the common man and also uh, the other healthcare providers however uh, nowadays after 20 years i would say that now we see that there is increase in awareness about ayurveda and uh, various other uh, complementary and alternative healthcare services so when it comes to the government of india now government of india is putting much effort into the development and growth of ayurveda worldwide yeah so they have collaborated with the, uh, even the who to establish uh, consistently uh, rigorous standards for ayurveda practice as well as for the education globally and uh, i firmly feel that uh, after the 20 years of practice that right now we are on the uh, right path um, though it took some time and it may take uh, more time to develop the standards and implement those standards but once uh, the uh, profession is firmly grounded in those standards regarding the education and the practice uh, so that it can ensure the quality and the safety and the effectiveness of ayurveda also ayurveda will keep on gaining the uh, increased acceptance and uh, respect worldwide Yeah, from my conversations with people, one of the things they like most about Ayurveda is that it's a very personalized sort of medicine, right? It's not one size fits all. It's not, hey, this is what I think you have, so here's what you. It understands what your unique body constitution is, and that's I think where the doshas come into place: vata, pitta, and kapha. So, can you talk to us about what these three doshas are, and maybe give a description of them? Yes, definitely. so ayurveda as i said it is the science of life it respects uh, the uniqueness of the individual and uh, ayurveda also consider uh, all levels of the individual be a mind body and a spiritual also so um, more emphasize on the prevention but if we say that the whole ayurveda science is based upon the five element theory and those five elements are air ether fire water and earth and um, known as the panch mahabhutas so uh, the five elements everything in the physical world is composed of those five elements and those five elements are the building blocks of the nature that's why we call it as mahabhutas and uh, mahabhutas are derived from the casual elements uh, which is also known as in ayurveda terminology uh, tan matras and all aspects of uh, universe is made up of different combinations of these mahabhutas so in overall if we see that uh, the whole world is nothing but the play of panch mahabhutas like the atom and the molecules and those five elements are space air fire water and earth where the um, akash mahabhut which is the ether is the most subtle element uh, while the earth element is the most heaviest grossest element and these elements are nothing uh, but the different densities of ether element so the denser the element has subtle element infused within them so those are the uh, sequential flow we can say in the element and why these elements are important in panch mahabhutas in the health so uh, for example as i said all natural things are uh, composed of those panch mahabhutas so fruits vegetables grain plants herbs animals humans everything is comprised of a different combination of those elements uh, that's the reason that herbs can be digested by the body and when we talk about uh, um, that the synthetic herbs synthetic herbs are lacking of those panch mahabhutas that's why those medicines have little bit of uh, side effect you can say are not getting assimilated properly in the body mm-hmm. and uh, those mahabhutas 
uh, we use as a therapeutic as well as diagnostic tool also. So for example, Mahabhutas with opposite qualities are used in the treatment of the uh, goal of maintaining or restoring the balance. To lose weight, um, heaviness is the quality of the earth element. Mm -hmm. So we use the lighter food, which is the lighter to digest, easier to digest, to lose the weight because that comprises of the air element, which is the lightest element. So in that way, um, we use the Panch Mahabhutas in the health. Mm -hmm. And now these five elements, if we see that uh, as a diagnostic utility, because if you see the space, for example, sound cannot exist without the space and uh, mm -hmm. lack of resistance or the, uh, th these are the typical qualities of the ether Mahabhuta. And the sense of sound, uh, how we use as a diagnostic utility um, by, uh, by escalating certain parts of the body. So that is the um, like a gurgling sound in the stomach, which gives the diagnostic tool that it is a sign of bloating, that the digestion is not working correctly. Touch, for example, is depends upon vibration or the movement, and that is belongs to the air element and the sense of touch if you see the ayurveda if you know about ayurveda the pulse diagnosis which happens because of the touch only the nadi vigyan pulse diagnosis and also the touch is the like a palpation of the abdominal organs give rise uh, tells uh, in a diagnostic field that uh, if there is a any tenderness or uh, uh, there is an enlargement or how the stomach uh, or the liver is working. So in mm. similar ways, all the Mahabhutas give their, and their senses give us the di diagnostic utilities. Now, when it comes to the uh, doshas, uh, the Panch Mahabhutas is a different story, the five elements, but how the biological application of Panch Mahabhutas in the Ayurveda, so it gives rise to three types of life forces, Vat, Pet, Kaf, so what, which is emotional energy, and uh, that is uh, with the combination of ether and air. And uh, pitta, which is a chemical activities, uh, that happens because of fire and water. And kapha, which is a solid substratum, cohesive force, that happens because of the um, earth and water. So these three doshas or three doshas are the three energies governing all the functions in the body. Mm. So as I said, Vata is movement, the energy of action, transportation. And uh, there are certain characters of Vata also, like it's a dry in nature, rough in nature, light, cold, subtle, and mobile also. Vata is always mobile. So mm. when we compare where the Vata is in the body, um, wherever you see the empty spaces, wherever you see the movement, right now I'm talking, blinking my eyes, that is also because of Vata. Pitta is a energy of transformation, conversion, digestion, and that is a combination of fire and water. So it has the character of fire as well as the water also. So fiery character, like it is oily in nature, sharp in nature, hot in nature, and moving also, light also, liquid also, and has an acidic smell also. Mm. Now comes to the third dosha, kapha. And that is the energy of construction. Uh, it is also um, the energy of lubrication. As I said that it is a cohesive force. So wherever we need the cohesion or the mobility, and the liquidity, there the kapha is there, like your synovial joint, saliva, that is also one form of kapha. Mm. And it provides the nourishment also. And the properties of the kapha is, uh, it is moist, it is cold, it is heavy, a um, little bit softness also, sticky also, and static also. So the three life forces now give rise to seven type of body type. So when in Ayurveda, there is a lot of hype about the body type, mm. which is also known as constitution and the prakriti. 
So these five elements give rise to three life forces. And these three uh, life forces combined together give rise to seven type of body type, which is also known as Prakriti, physical as well as mental Prakriti. So physical constitution uh, or your body type, depending upon the relative uh, predominance of the three doshas. And uh, it can be Vata, Pitta, Kapha, Vata, Pitta, Vata, Kapha, Kapha, Vata, and the combination of all three, Vata, Pitta, Kapha. And uh, when we talk about uh, seven body types, individual body type is very, very hard to uh, find. And most of the times when uh, we do the diagnostic uh, assessment, uh, then we see either the person is Vata, Pitta, or Pitta, Kapha, both are dominant, or the three doshas are always present. So it's kind of like your genetic coding. And uh, the dominance happen um, because um, I, I always uh, laugh uh, that blame your parents. Because mm. the mom conceived the baby, depending upon the parents' diet, lifestyle, their stress level, and everything contributed towards those uh, body types. Interesting. So if somebody, I mean, this is firstly really interesting for, especially for somebody who's for the first time, because when I announced this, a lot of people said that, you know, I've heard about body types. I've heard about the doshas and I want to learn more. And you've explained this in a very wonderful way that it ultimately boils down to your unique prakriti and there are different combinations. It's never just one. It might be two or it might be all three. How does a person go about discovering their own body type? Because I see a lot of you know quizzes online. Right? Mm -hmm. Answer a few questions, you get to know. Are those accurate, or how do you how do you go about it? Um, I I would say those are accurate. Um, okay. That will give you the your genetic composition of about the body types. Okay. Uh, so when you do the assessment, there is a prakriti and vikruti. Prakriti is like your uh, natural constitution, and vikruti is where the imbalance is. So uh, how do you find your body type? This is little secret. <laughs> so Vata people, if we see that uh, they have the certain characteristic, they talk very fast, they walk very fast, they cannot sit still. There mm. is always a movement uh, when you see the Vata person. They are very tall, very thin, mm. and uh, you can find a little bit of restless also in them. Okay. And, uh, uh, their skin is more uh, tend to be on the drier side because vata characters is a dry in nature. And uh, um, they tend to be feel very cold also. That is also one of the characteristic of vata. Now, when it comes to the pitta people, uh, the pitta people, they are fiery in character. Mm. They are very, very fast. And once they get angry, it's very hard for them to calm them down. They take their own sweet okay. time. And if you see their skin also, uh, it's all glowing, especially if they go in the sun, it will be all red, shiny red uh, on the face. You can see that. And uh, they love spicy food. Mm. And if they get hungry, they want the food right away. Otherwise, uh, they will be really upset okay. because they cannot sustain hunger. And they eat very fast. And uh, most of the Pitta people, if I have seen in my life, um, when they eat, they sweat a lot. Mm. They have natural heat in the body and the digestive heat mixed with the body produces a lot of sweat. And uh, now comes to the Kapha people. So Kapha people, if you see, they have the broad shoulders um, and, uh, and they talk very slow, they walk very slow and they uh, love sweets and they love to sleep also. Most of mm. the procrastinator, if we see, belongs to this category. Oh. <laughs> and uh, also uh, the Kapha people, um, they put on weight very quickly and it is hard for them to lose the weight. Mm. And all these three uh, life forces or the doshas have five subtypes also. So it's going to be too much details. But yeah. Yeah. And uh, they live in a specific areas in the body. Yeah. So this is the generalized information regarding the doshas, that how one can determine on general 
physical characters, how what type of body type you have. Got it. So Action Tribe, if you're watching this, especially on YouTube, where we're streaming this right now, think about it. Like what body type do you feel you come under based on the characteristics that were shared? Let us know. Are you Vata? Are you Pitta or Kava? What is it? Or do you have a friend who you're like, that person is definitely a Kava? Let us know in the comments below because we'd love to know what you're thinking, what you're you know sensing right now. Uh, so Minakshi, you're a Vaidya, right? So what is a Vaidya and what is the process of becoming one? So Vaidya means uh, who knows, who has the knowledge. Okay. So in Ayurveda terminology, uh, Vaidya is uh, Ayurveda physician. And the process to become a Vaidya, the similar way in Ayurveda, uh, in India is uh, you do your uh, uh, senior high school, then you give the test uh, to get an admission in the med school. And yeah. there you to choose that if you want to opt for the, I see somebody commented, I am Kapha. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So that that process um, takes Bachelor of Ayurveda Medicine and Surgery for, uh, that is a six year curriculum, including the internship where you uh, get to see the patients in the OPDs and uh, you do the charting and all. Yeah. And then after that, uh, if somebody wants to uh, go further, they can do the MD. We have eight branches in Ayurveda for the MDs also. Like uh, I have done my MD in uh, Kumar Bhatia, which is a, uh, at that time it was combined uh, OBG1 as well as the pediatrics. So I am specialized in Ayurveda in that. And, oh. uh, and then there is a PhD also, if somebody wants to have the more for the knowledge about that and mm -hmm. want to go into the research also uh, yeah. so that is the way to go it, so what i like about ayurveda like i've alluded to before is that it's it's a science right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's a science it's step by step there's a lot of logic involved observation personalized right um, and what does Ayurveda say about anxiety? Because right now, as you can imagine, a lot of people are going through anxiety, stress, depression, and challenges because of what is happening around us, but also within us because of what is happening around us. But what are the causes of anxiety according to Ayurveda? So when we say that there is anxiety is related to a lot of moment, so when there is a lot of movement uh, in Ayurveda, we say that it is related to the Vat Dosha. Okay. And also because, uh, as I said, the Vat is always mobile. There is always a movement. And in anxiety also, one thought comes, then another thought comes, and the person keeps on thinking about uh, sometimes and worrying about the things which are, which are there and sometimes which are not there yet. Uh, and also it is related to uh, the mind dosha also, which is known as uh, raja. Raja mm. is also related to the anxiety where there is a lot of uh, movement going on. So when we talk about uh, like a uh, mind doshas, sattva raja tama. So sattva means the mind is totally pure. A raja where there is a lot of movement, which if it gets into imbalance because of certain diet or the thoughts, excessive use of senses, then it leads to the anxiety. And the tama is totally stagnation. So mm. tama leads to if there is a certain diet and again the lifestyle is there, then it leads to the depression. So to give to it, I'll, I'll explain with the analogy. So uh, supposedly we go to the lake. So the water is totally clear. When mm. you uh, look into the water, you can see your reflection. And uh, surrounding area is also seems to be very happy. And that stage of mind is known as sattva mind, pure mind, where everything is clean, everything is clear, you can see your reflection. Yeah. And then comes the raja. Now imagine the storm is coming and everything is moving. Um, the fish is inside the lake, scared. In, uh, the person who is walking here and there, they are scared that the storm is coming. And all the mud surrounding the lake started uh, blowing also. So the, there is nothing to see there also now. 
So that stage is called as Raja. So where mm. the mind is very, very anxious. And then the stage comes after the storm passed, you see that all the mud which was blowing uh, now has filled the lake and there is the water is totally muddy. You cannot see anything. And that stage of stagnation where there is no movement, nothing clear, clear that is known as Tama, which is related to the depression also. So that's how the three stages, uh, one um, guna and two doshas of mind are explained. So what can a person maybe who's at home right now do to alleviate some of the symptoms or maybe to restore some balance, especially if they've been going through some anxiety? So uh, first of all, I will say the breath work, which you are offering. That is also very, very important because with the right breath work, one can activate the parasympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. Sympathetic nervous system is, which is a uh, fight and flight mode. And parasympathetic is rest and digest. So when yep. we see that uh, the anxiety is high, the cortisol level high, and that cortisol leads to the activation of the sympathetic nervous system. And with the right type of breathing, pranayama, and different type of other type of breathings, one can always control that uh, um, those uh, fearful senses. Uh, and uh, also can activate the sympathetic nervous system and that can help with the combating the anxiety. Now, the second thing a person can do uh, at home, uh, the walking is also very, very important. Mm. When you are in the nature, especially outdoor walking, if the weather permits, uh, when you are in the nature, then nature helps in healing in a certain way. So walking is also important. So whenever there is a time or whenever there is a weather permits, just go for outdoor walking, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, morning and evening, depending upon your schedule. And the third thing one can do is to combat the anxiety is um, yoga now also. Yoga Nidra is also very, very beneficial for that. And uh, fourth thing, uh, self body massage, which is also known as Abhyanga in Ayurveda, we say that. That one can choose the oil like sesame oil or the olive oil or coconut oil. Various oils are uh, there to choose. Make the oil a little warm and do the self application of the oil. Because touch is also a therapeutic touch, especially. Again, helps with the anxiety and activates the parasympathetic nervous system. So these are the certain things which one can do at home to combat the anxiety, especially during this pandemic time. So Action Tribe listeners, which one resonates most with you? Because if you see a theme of what Minakshi is sharing, it is basically to calm down, slow down and take care of yourself. And that taking care could be through breath work, really calming your breath down, extending your exhales, and focusing on your breath it could be just going out for a walk especially if you live nearby nature or even even if you're not fresh air is always good for you and then we're going to go deeper into this but abhyanga basically using oil and touching your own self giving yourself that level of comfort and assurance and detoxifying we're going to get we're going to go deeper into this so if you're interested in the details of abhyanga uh, self oil massage then stay tuned. But before that, Minakshi, what is Brahma Muhurta? As we speak about alignment, as we speak about, you know, understanding nature and the cycle of nature, what is Brahma Muhurta? And why is it beneficial for someone to wake up at that time? <laughs> uh, so Brahma means the knowledge. Hmm. So that is the time period when one can attain self-knowledge about your inner self, as well mm -hmm. as if you want to uh, have the social knowledge also. Yeah. That is the time when the atmosphere is totally pure. So there is a flow of positive energy, which is also known as prana in the atmosphere. And that you cultivate during that time period. And what is that uh, exact time period? No matter uh, in which part of the globe you are, Exact is 96 minutes before the sunrise. 
No matter if you are sitting in Australia, India, United States, Canada, any part of the world or Europe, it's exactly same for everybody, 96 minutes before the sunrise. And the importance is that, as I said, that is the time period which is considered as a, uh, we call it as a Amrit Vela, Embryos time, God's time, because the atmosphere mm -hmm. is so pure, uh, pure, you can cultivate the positive energy, uh, not only at the physical level, at the mental level also. There is no, um, uh, uh, noise pollution also, if you see that the nature, uh, you can hear the birds also after some time, uh, you can experience the golden rays of the sun also. And those uh, at, at that time period, looking at the sun also is more beneficial for your eyes as well. So that's why in Ayurveda, the time period is very, very emphasized, especially if you want to follow the dincharya, which is like a daily routine. Mm -hmm. And daily routine starts with the Brahma Mahurita, which is exactly 96 minutes before the sunrise. So that's about a little over an hour and a half, right? Yes. Uh, so hour and a half before sunrise. So let's say the sun, as an example, you know, rises at 6 a.m. You're talking about 4.30? 4.30 a.m.? 4.30, 4.35? Okay. For a lot of people, that's going to be very challenging, right? Because there was, and I'll be honest with you. I always am honest with my listeners and I, you know, share whatever challenges that I'm going through. There was a streak and I made an episode about that as well, where I woke up every day for at 5 a.m. And I was on a streak. But then I went, you know, down the ravines. And for some reason, I was not able to, you know, go back to that same routine of waking up at 5 a.m. And it was really enjoyable that phase that streak that i that i enjoyed because like you pointed out at that time of the morning it's a different energy altogether it's very pure and you can get so many things done but suppose somebody now it's 2021 right in a, in a few days in a few weeks and if somebody's resolution is to wake up at brahma murta right maybe whatever it is whether it's 5 a.m or 5 15 a.m how does someone go about waking up at that time without any force effortlessly what are your thoughts on that i would say you need to go uh, right at a time uh, early to bed early to rise okay the old thing so um from past four or five years i have made this resolution that i will wake up at five okay um I'm in Texas and the sun rises approximately during the winter time around 6.30, 6.45. Mm -hmm. Now I don't need even the alarm automatically. Even if I want to sleep till late, I am up at 5 daily. Okay. Because I corrected my sleep, I go to bed by 10, 10.30 maximum. Very rare I prolong my sleep time, uh, bedtime past yeah. 10.30. So if you want to make uh, changes, go start slowly. If you are a uh, habit of uh, uh, going to the bed around 12, I would say let's work towards the 11 o'clock for 10 days. And then after 10 days, start going towards the 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Similarly, in the morning also, if you are waking up around 8 o'clock, then try to wake up for 10 days around 7 o'clock. Once you get used to that, then change further 6 o'clock. And that's how one can cultivate the habit. And once the body gets adjusted, your metabolism gets adjusted to that time period, then you don't need to make an effort. Then it will be effortless for you. Interesting. Because it's going to sleep and waking up in the morning are so intricate, intricately connected, right? If you yes. go to sleep very late, you're not hitting your sleep cycles. That affects your, your mood in the morning. I mean, which comes to my next question, what does Ayurveda say about the grogginess or the headache or the brain fog that one might have when they wake up in the morning? You know that sometimes you have a really nice sleep and it's so satisfying, so healing. You enjoy it. Even though you don't feel like sleeping another two hours, you're satisfied. And sometimes you just wake up and you're, you know, you're waking up with a groggy head. What is the cause of that? So many, many causes uh, can happen because of that. Uh, I would say that sometimes uh, the digestion is not working correctly. 
because your digestive system is uh, directly related to your sleep also and sleep is directly related to your digestive system okay. so for example if we are sleeping past 10 o'clock then your body starts sending signal that it is not a sleep time and people if you notice that the um, aj that the people start uh, looking for the snacks at that time yeah because the body starts sending signal and the stomach start producing more acid and mm -hmm. uh, that actually disrupt the digestive system and then in the morning when you wake up you will feel heavy in spite of having 6 hour 7 hour sleep you won't feel fresh and that is the reason because the digestive system is not working correctly and build up of ama ama is also known as the toxins in the body yeah. and that toxins um happen because of either not a, uh, having a proper sleep or not having a proper digestion and those amas when it uh, reaches to certain level it goes in the various channels in the body and then based upon which organ or which uh, area of the body is weak it start giving the pathological conditions in that area so it's just like a, you are filling the uh, bucket and it is a dripping and once yeah. it is filled uh, the toxins goes everywhere so uh, for that Ayurveda suggests the detoxification. Got it. So, Action Tribe, if you're listening right now and if you're having a hard time falling asleep or getting good quality sleep, let us know in the comments because, you know, we really want to know what type of challenges our listeners and our audience is facing. Vinakshi, what are your thoughts on these blue light blocking glasses? Because I've been reading a lot of about them and one of the challenges that I face as I try to improve my own quality of sleep is that you, know, you just can't help but using your mobile phone, even in the evenings, like not before sleeping, but even in the evenings, it still affects you, right? Because the body technically wants to shut down according to the circadian rhythm. But like you pointed out, the phone or the laptop reminds them that it's still day because of which we feel hungry and we go to the kitchen. So have you heard about these blue light blocking glasses that are yellowish in color and they protect, they prevent certain spectrum of light coming into our eyes? Yes, I have heard about that. But in, uh, uh, first of all, I would suggest that that uh, limit of that, as I discussed, that uh, three pillars of life, Aha, Nidra, Brahmacharya. Yeah. So overindulgence in, of the senses in uh, mobile phone or the laptop, which sometimes mm -hmm. it's mandatory, but sometimes we just out of habit, we do that. Yeah. So that is also important to break that habit, especially at the bedtime. Uh, no gadgets in the bedroom. But if mm -hmm. you have to do, then uh, it's a controversial that uh, the yellow glasses, uh, the, the blue light blocking glasses, if you do that, that will help in um, with the, your sleep pattern also. It won't disrupt your sleep. Mm -hmm. And uh, recently, one of the doctors shared the study actually where the blue lights actually disrupt your metabolism also yeah not only the sleep but the disrupt the metabolism also so the best thing is one can do that instead of using uh, the protective glasses let's break the habit of not taking the phones or the laptops or the ipads or the gadgets uh, in the bedroom and the second thing one can do uh, that uh, warm oil massage as i said if you can't do for the whole body then this area the forehead and the side and the foot those are the three areas which are very very important uh, if you do before going to the bed even for two minutes five minutes it will make a huge difference in the quality of the sleep because the foot contains so many points which gets activated and start helping in uh, uh, creating the balance at the organs, all, all the organ levels. And that's mm -hmm. how you can improve the quality of the sleep as well. Yeah, it's very interesting. And I think what we're doing collectively is that we're becoming more mindful of our rhythms and our patterns, right? Because technically, I'm sitting in front of a computer right now at 6 p.m. in the evening, and I've got a large ring light that's shooting blue light to me. It's not yellow light, it's blue light, right? So what I should be doing right now is wearing one of those 
uh, orange glasses and it's on my list. I got to buy it one of these days and we'll see how effective it is. I don't like to make judgments before buying something, but part of my life experience is about experimenting. So I'll let you know how it goes. But uh, the other thing like we're discussing today is not just sleep, but nutrition, right? Yeah. And when it comes to nutrition, Ayurveda says eat seasonally. Mm -hmm. But what does that really mean? And how does one go about um, identifying and knowing what is and what isn't in season? Because that can be pretty complex, right? <laughs> that is true. These things, everything is available uh, yeah. months, uh, in a year. So uh, seasonally, if you see that, um, we change our clothing, right? Right now I'm wearing also the sweater because here the temperature is in 30s, I think. So uh, these sweaters I cannot wear during the summertime. Similar where the summer t-shirts I cannot wear in the winter time. So yeah. that's how nature has provided us in abundance, the natural food according to the season. Um, many times I see in my practice uh, that uh, people do consume nuts throughout the year, raw salads throughout the year. Um, because salads are healthy, nuts are healthy, nut bars are healthy, but not according to the season. So nut produces a lot of heat in the body. And when we do need the heat during the winter time, similar way, the salads produce a lot of coldness in the body because salad has more water component. It produces cold in the body. And when we need the cold in the body during the summertime. Mm -hmm. So if we keep on consuming the food which we need in an opposite season, that will mess up our digestion as well as mess up our mental health as well. So that's why Ayurveda always emphasize on the seasonal diet. And uh, uh, Couple of years back, I was presenting in the international conference and I took the topic, this one, the seasonal diet and uh, how it impacts the gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came across a couple of research uh, on the humans also. There was many research has been done on the animals, but a couple of researchers were on the human also, where it was like the gut microbiome composition also changes according to the season. There are certain gut microbiome which get activated during the winter time. And those are the those gut microbiome which helps in digesting, uh, digesting the complex carb. Mm -hmm. And those complex carb, if you see that seasonally we see in the wheat or in the root vegetables. And wheat is also heat producing. Root vegetables also being a complex and being, it happened to be grown in also in the winter season or the fall season. So nature has given us a tool. It is us we are not implementing in our day-to-day -day life. How one can uh, differentiate what is in the season, what is not in the season. So mm -hmm. two, I always tell in my practice also, uh, to my students also. So whenever you go to the supermarket, first of all, look at the price structure. So uh, with the price structure, you will get to know that, uh, okay, this is in the season and this is not in the season. And if you happen to have in the local market, local farmers market, especially, there you will get the uh, things which are coming locally grown mm -hmm. from the farmers. And that can give you an idea of what is in your, uh, in your region, what is in the season. And I think that will also give you an opportunity to speak to the farmers or whoever is selling those vegetables. Because sometimes right, buying vegetables can be such a impersonal experience, right? You just go, you throw stuff into your basket and then you go to the checkout. But here, if you make an attempt, you're right, at least speaking about asking these so profound questions, hey, is this vegetable in season or not? And sometimes if you get the opportunity to meet the farmer themselves, they will also feel good because it's directly from farmer, you know, to the consumer, which, which sort of is good for the farmers as well, right? Because they don't have these. It is like you are supporting your health also and you are supporting your local farmers also, which is very, very important. Got it. Okay, so in eat in season. And, you know, if you don't know what vegetables are in season, then you can go to the place where you source your vegetables, look at the prices. And also have some conversations, which will help you identify. So that is one, um, eat in season. 
because our gut microbiome also changes according to the season to support the type of food that we're going to consume based on the season. So that's interesting. And speaking of a condiment or a fat that has so many uh, benefits, right? It's called the golden nectar, if I'm not mistaken. It smells great, tastes great. And people in India know about it because they've been using it since childhood, which is ghee. But why are people around the world increasingly choosing ghee over other fats? So first of all, ghee is in Ayurveda is considered as a Medhya Rasayana. Mm -hmm. So uh, Medhya means uh, which is related to your nervous system. And uh, it helps in promoting, it, it acts as a wine tonic. It gives the uh, nourishment to the brain. Second thing is ghee is also considered as a sattvic food, which is also a pure food. So, and if you see that the ghee has the property of, uh, it is cooling in nature. It helps in balancing all the doshas if used appropriately. And uh, also ghee provides nourishment and lubrication to the joints as well. Mm. And if we see that the, uh, um, the clinical studies, ghee contains uh, linolenic, uh, conjugated linolenic acid mm. and the bitteric acid. And the bitteric acid is the one which needed for the good bacteria in your colon. Oh. So that's why uh, the ghee is much more needed in the diet on daily basis. And that bitteric acid is also uh, present in your uh, nervous system. The sheet, myelin sheet, and the cerebrospinal fluid. So there also, if you see that the Ayurveda, which is a science of 5,000 year old science, already has proved that the ghee is an ervine tonic, medhya rasana, as well as very helpful for the digestion if we used in a proper way. So would you consider ghee to be a prebiotic because it supports the growth Good. of yeah. yes. bacteria? Yes. Okay. That is interesting. So then how is ghee different from or advantages over having butter? So butter is kind of like a process. If we see that the regular uh, normal market bought butter, that is yeah. considered as a uh, processed food. Okay. The actual way of forming the ghee is uh, you make, you uh, take the yogurt uh, and then churn the yogurt out of the, when you blend the yogurt nicely, and uh, then you get the cream out of the yogurt. You get that uh, cream out of that and then melt it in a, at a certain uh, temperature, uh, mild to medium temperature one can use. And uh, that will give us the pure ghee, which is in Ayurveda form of, we consider as a ghee, not the directly from the processed butter from the market. So that is the difference between the butter and the ghee. And butter does have a little bit of bitteric acid, but because of the processing, that bitteric acid, the body cannot utilize that. Because if you see the butter also, it has natural flavoring and a lot of other stuff. So the body cannot process that. Whereas the pure ghee does not have any uh, uh, natural flavor. It has natural flavor, but it does not have any flavoring added or any additive added. So that is also uh, one of the benefit having the ghee in the diet. So you're saying butter is bioavailable, is available but not bioavailable. So it has yes. a nitric acid, but it's not the body's not able to absorb it. But ghee, because it's natural, does not have added flavorings. It's really good, not just for the nervous system, but it's good for our good bacteria as well, which is a double whammy. So. Apart from adding ghee to our food, right? Do, are there any other ways that you can use ghee maybe during the day for self-care nourishment? Uh, one can always add in the diet. Uh, yeah. If somebody does not have any cholesterol issue or heart health issues, then one to two teaspoon of the ghee can be added on a regular basis. Apart from adding in the diet, what can always have a uh, that golden milk haldi wala dood um, haldi means turmeric so turmeric milk or turmeric these days it is a um, 
one can always boil the milk with the turmeric saffron nutmeg black pepper ginger powder um boil nicely and then add half teaspoon of ghee into that and consume uh, during the bedtime uh when there is a sleep is a challenge or if you are not getting good night sleep this is one of the best thing what can do why because first of all the ghee also has the kapha property vat pit ka we discussed right and the milk also is related to the kapha and the sleep also happens because of the kapha when the body produces more kapha then the person start feeling drowsy or the sleepy and that is the kapha time period as well so mm -hmm. everywhere if we see that that is the ideal time to have a turmeric milk along with the ghee for the good night sleep that's another way one can introduce into that and ghee we use in a certain proportion for the panch karma also which is a detoxifying techniques uh, panch means five karma means procedures to prepare the body for the detoxification we use the ghee in a certain proportion according to the your constitution your health history as well as uh, your age on a regular basis empty stomach early in the morning that yeah. also one can utilize and the similar key can be processed with many many herbs uh, to get the benefit of those herbs also uh, as well as the key along with that that also one can use to improve the digestion uh, even for the vision purpose also we use the eyesight also and the clarity of voice also we use that also and uh, then the joint health also different herbs processed with the um, key one can utilize in that way also so they go action tribe we are sharing a lot of really useful information and this is very practical as well right so i know since i was a kid turmeric milk was very popular in my family whenever somebody would have a cough or cold or feel tired you know turmeric plus milk plus some herbs maybe some pepper and some I don't remember whether my mom put ghee or not, or maybe she did. But uh, turmeric milk is something that's very tasty, but also is good for you. So let us know in the comments if you have tried turmeric milk in the past. The good thing is that it's easy to make, so it doesn't take a lot of time. But it's very restorative, especially as you go to sleep. It'll help relax you, and calm you down. Now, I Minakshi, mean, India has historically been known as a producer and exporter of pepper. right mm -hmm. even in the roman times thousands of years back they used to import indian pepper from south india so talk to us about the spice combination called tikatu and how can you use it so tikatu uh, yeah. yeah tikatu so tikatu is very uh, i would say the versatile combination it contains uh, black pepper ginger powder and long pepper so uh, long pepper the botanical name is uh, piper nigrum and uh, the part used for that uh, pepper is a fruit we use and uh, the properties as per ayurveda we see that it is very pungent in nature so less is always good just okay. pinch if you want to utilize not more than that and it is a, it also has a very sharp properties and very heat producing that's why ideal time to use during the winter time and uh, also uh, it helps in balancing the kapha and the vata mm. so if somebody has uh, like a ongoing congestion or the allergies and or the joint issues or uh, uh, bloating in the stomach so pinch of uh, black uh, this uh, long pepper will help uh, uh, in a long way uh, the pepper also improves appetite digestion also and uh, as i said we use a lot uh, especially when it is related to the respiratory health and uh, pepper especially the black pepper also increases bioavailability of various other herbs yeah uh, especially the turmeric uh, the curcumin part of the turmeric because curcumin doesn't get absorbed properly in the body if you are utilizing the whole turmeric that is a different story but when you are using only the curcumin part then the combination with the black pepper 
is very very important because it enhances the bioavailability of that turmeric uh, the curcumin then the second component of uh, uh, this tricatu is a ginger ginger uh, in the dry form uh, ginger is again a pungent three katu three three means three katu means pungent so all the three herbs uh, or the spices we use in that those are very pungent so that's why less is always good and it is very lighter to digest and it has a little bit of oiliness also and again it is also uh, very hot in uh, nature um like black pepper also ginger also improves the appetite and uh, also it is a stimulant also so when somebody is not feeling hungry uh, then it helps in bringing back the appetite also and uh, ginger is also very useful especially the dry ginger powder uh, because it is a anti inflammatory mm -hmm. and uh, also uh, helps with the uh, during the pregnancy if somebody has the nausea or the vomiting uh, in that also the ginger uh, tea uh, can be a beneficial and uh, um, dry ginger is also very very helpful for uh, the voice quality for the throat mm -hmm. and uh, the third one is uh, we say that the long pepper okay as the black pepper then the ginger and then the long pepper so long pepper is also again very pungent uh, very good for the respiratory health so main function of tricatu is to improve the digestion and if you see that if you have a ever come across ayurveda cooking ayurveda cooking is very unique and unique in the sense that it incorporates right spices and herbs herbs especially which has all the taste uh, in the food when you cook your food uh, not only to improve the taste uh, to make the food satisfying nurturing and uh, more importantly that it stimulates the pachak pitta um, as i said the pitta also has the five sub varieties so pachak pitta which actually uh, helps in improving the digestion so digestive juices you can correlate with that Mm -hmm. and, uh, since it has a lot of medicinal properties also not only the flavor and the uh, other things so that's why in ayurveda we say that let the food be made medicine yeah i love i love pepper especially when i'm adding it to my own uh, meal prep at home um i've always loved pepper but these days even more so as i get really good quality pepper it smells good tastes good but ginger i never used to like you know ginger for some reason i love garlic but um i've never been that fond of ginger but now that it has so many benefits i'm going to try more of it i remember as a kid when in india you get sugarcane juice they normally add ginger right mm -hmm. and it's so amazing that our ancient elders knew the various combinations of herbs and spices that only not not only improve the taste but it also increases the bioavailability like you mentioned the um turmeric milk how smart of them to say no we're going to put turmeric but also we're going to add pepper so that it improves and enhances the bioavailability of that drink so that it's more effective so that's really interesting and ayurveda has a lot to say about longevity right mm -hmm. so living not only a longer life but a more fulfilling life more white with more vitality so how does someone you know go about using ayurveda to look and feel young um that is i, I think the anti aging everybody wants these days right <laughs> yeah um so there is a one aspect of ayurveda where it is called as rasayana rasayana is uh, rejuvenating and that rasayana is not only related to certain type of food or certain type of uh, herbs which will help in improving the quality of the skin or the longevity uh, or act as a anti aging there are certain types of behaviors also sadvrit means how one should act in a certain time period that also is uh, also uh, related to the rasayana rejuvenating and the 
climate change. So um, various things one can do, uh, sleep also, uh, the free radicals and the sleep, if you will know that. Now the science also, the Western science also has uh, proved that the sleep, if you are not sleeping properly or less sleep, you will be uh, aging quickly. Mm. So here we have the three pillars, diet, sleep, and control use of senses. To explain that, if we want to achieve the anti-aging or want to uh, have the rejuvenating effect, we need to first work on these three pillars of the life. Then comes, there are many uh, rasayana which one can utilize. Gratam is also like ghee is also one kind of rasayana. Uh, then um, the classical, if we see that the chavan prash, if you yeah. know the story of uh, uh, one sage named chavan uh, who were more than 100 year old and how he achieved. And based upon that, there is a formulation known as chavan prash which people think that uh, that also gives the rasana effect it does uh, but then it will utilize in the proper way and in the proper season um, but along with that definitely your lifestyle also matter your sleep matters your dietary habits and the stress main thing is the stress when we are more stressful then also we age very quickly so you know, especially if somebody is self-isolating at home in the midst of this pandemic, what can somebody do to get started uh, in terms of maybe like a self-care therapy or something that they can do at home in order to get started with um, with longevity protection measures or to feel, you know, rejuvenated or feel like they've got a lot of vital vital life force within themselves? Is there some practice you recommend that they can do maybe in the morning or something like that? So, uh, so far it is a nutshell. I would say that uh, um, and definitely the pranayama also will helpful in that. The yoga practice also will be helpful in that. Uh, the self body massage, if one can do on daily basis, especially with the sesame oil, that also helps with the, uh, especially the outer look, we say that uh, the skin it nourishes the skin uh, because uh, sesame oil, again, it is rich in conjugated linoleic acid and uh, also rich in calcium also. And sure. when you start at certain age, like 50, 50 plus, it is not like that you cannot start early, but here we are talking about the anti-aging. So I am uh, like in that way, that 50, 50 plus, then your skin start to lose uh, that glow or the luster and uh, to prevent that, one can utilize sesame oil in a natural way to just uh, give the pampering massage, a self body massage uh, in the form of a bhyanga. Now at home also, the more you will get active, the more you get going, uh, uh, that also helps with a uh, lot many factors like stress as well as uh, to improve uh, uh, the immune system also. Because especially in this pandemic, we say that, okay, take this, it will help in building the immune system. But immune system takes a year of practice to build up. It is not like overnight you can build up your immune system. Mm -hmm. So when you correct all these three aspects of uh, Ayurveda, three pillars of the life, again, it is again on that only, Aha Nidra Brahmacharya means diet, sleep pattern, and uh, uh, how you your lifestyle is. Uh, then one can even improve the immune system and uh, also prolong the aging effect also, uh, prevent the aging effect. Yeah, and as you said that you encouraged people to do like an abhyanga or self oil massage every day, I can imagine one going every day. Isn't that a lot to put oil in your body? What are your thoughts to that? Is it manageable or sustainable to do every day? Or... What tips or advice do you have for somebody who wants to get started with this? So, as I said, if you cannot do every day, then at least at bedtime, just do two minutes of uh, uh, foot massage and uh, forehead and the temple area massage because those areas are really, really important. Mm -hmm. But normally I suggest, okay, let's start with the five minutes only. 15 to 20 minutes before your shower, you just do the five minutes of quick oil massage. 
and then wait for 10 to 15 minutes and then go for a shower. That is a more doable as compared to doing the long one hour or two hours of massage. Uh, the Abhyanga, if you want to do in a proper way, then uh, maybe the weekends when you have more mm -hmm. leisure time uh, yeah. during the morning hours, then one can use 30 minutes or one hour. But at least start five minutes and then slowly, slowly you can uh, build up that time period up to 30 minutes, depending upon the schedule. And what are some of the different oils that one can work with? You said sesame oil is one. Are there any other oils that one can use based on their dosha or based on the season that they are in right now? So for winter season, definitely the sesame. Sesame is considered as one of the best oil in Ayurveda as well. Okay. Uh, but apart from the sesame, uh, during the summertime, uh, one can utilize coconut oil. And if somebody's body is like producing more heat, especially for the females who are undergoing through the menopause, then also they can alternate sesame as well as the coconut because coconut is little cooling in nature. Mm -hmm. One can also utilize almond oil also and uh, olive oil also. Depending upon the constitution for Vata people, I would say that uh, this the sesame oil is the best. For Pitta, the coconut oil is best. And for kapha people also, they can use either the sesame oil or mm -hmm. either use the neutral oil like a, um, the grapeseed oil or the olive oil for that reason. Awesome. You know, the other day, actually a couple of weeks back, I went for a full body massage and it was not an Ayurvedic massage. I think it was maybe like a mixture of deep tissue massage and a little bit of Swedish massage. And the person used some kind of cream. They didn't use any oil or something like that. So it felt good. It was, it was not bad. But then once I went home, then the effects did not last for a long time. You know, then I went back to my normal life in terms of my life force energy. And, you know, it just sometimes, you know, the effect lingers on, right, for many hours mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And then a few days later on, I, um, I did an Abhyanga. So I had a whole body oil, oil bath. I didn't even, it was not a massage, right? It was just me massaging my own self. And I used olive oil. And then I had a bath, a warm shower. It was in the evening. But the refreshment and the nourishment and the relaxation that I felt after that, I think was much better than the massage as well that I got. I was able to sleep better. My skin was much more glowing. I just felt more cared for. So we talk about self-love, right? This is an actual way to love yourself. Apart from saying affirmations, you're literally loving yourself through the oil, through the massage. Actually, but the Abhyanga itself means uh, to love yourself. It literally to means... Touch your, yes, to touch yourself with the love. Mm -hmm. So Abhi Anga means uh, uh, to touch yourself uh, with the love. So that is the little meaning of that. So when you do by yourself, definitely yeah. it generates more effect and when you use the oil especially the if the oil is warm or heated oil that penetrates also deeper into the seven layer of the body and that give you rejuvenating effect and freshens your physical body as well as the mental body yeah so action trap i would highly recommend if you've not done it before to just you know order some oil you know get some oil heat it up a little bit and Meenakshi, what kind of strokes do you recommend when doing a Abhyanga? Any recommendations in terms of types of strokes, like circular strokes, up and down? So in Abhyanga, we say that uh, uh, main Abhyanga, we address towards the Vat Dosha. And uh, the Vat is the one which has the downward moment. So if when you get a Western massage, it is always in the upward direction towards mm. the heart because you want to give the, um, the flow, uh, the blood flow to moving towards the heart. But actually in Ayurveda, it is opposite. We do the downward movement because we are addressing the Vat Dosha, which controls everything. So out of three Doshas, Vata, Pitta and Kapha, Vata, as I said, it is the main Doshas because without Vata, Pitta cannot move, cannot function, Kapha cannot move. So it's just like air. You cannot lit the fire without the air. Mm. And uh, if there is no air, nothing can be movable. 
mobility happens because of the air element. So uh, to address that, the downward stroke, especially uh, from abdomen downward, uh, on the legs, long stroke one can do, on the arms also long strokes. In the stomach, the way the colon is like uh, on the right side, you go upward because that is how the ascending colon is. And then there is a uh, transverse colon, which is kind of like a straight. And there you go uh, in a simple strokes. And then there is a downward descending column, which goes in the downward movement. So mm. that's how in the circular um, way one can do uh, on the stomach, on the abdomen. And one thing I want you to add into that. Uh, so abdomen, if somebody has like a issue with the stagnation where there is a constipation issue, this circular motion will uh, actually helps in keeping the things more mobile. And uh, also one can use, especially for the stomach, castor oil also, because castor oil has the properties of the laxative also. And mm -hmm. castor oil is also considered as very good for the skin. So yeah. one can also use the castor oil for the stomach. Whole body might be a little more sticky because it has, uh, it, it is very viscous, the viscosity. Yes, yeah. more, yes. So, but at least for stomach one can utilize. So here's what I propose everyone who's listening, whether you're on iTunes or Spotify or YouTube, uh, we're going to do a Abhyanga challenge. And what that means is you are going to select what oil you want to use. You're going to select when you're going to schedule it on your calendar and you are going to actually do it. You're actually going to do the personal self massage Abhyanga. And this is going to be a challenge. You're going to do it and, and have a nice, relaxing bath after that. Okay. And once you finish that, take a screenshot or take a photo of yourself feeling, you know, vital and happy and joyful and tag both of us on Instagram so that we can have the shared moment, right? So this is the hashtag Abhyanga challenge. Um, so take a photo of you after you finish that Abhyanga, that's self massage and then tag me my um, handle is at my seven chakras at seven is a word my seven chakras and Minakshi are you on Instagram yes I am and it is Ayu Roots so you can tag me on Ayu Roots it's A Y U double R double O T S Ayu Roots there you go I'm also going to do the Abhyanga challenge and I'm going to tag myself <laughs> and I'm going to tag uh you know, Minakshi as well, but I want everyone to try this out because it is simple and anyone can do it and you will notice the shift. So thanks Minakshi for sharing all of this so far. Action Tribe, I hope you enjoyed today's session as much as I did. We're learning more and more about the importance of our emotions, our thoughts, our breathing pattern and our diet because everything is connected and they all help um, our overall health. They, they build on top of each other. We're also realizing that each of us needs to take control of our own health and not fully depend on our doctors. Thanks to the internet, you can become informed and you can play that role yourself to prevent illness and disease in yourself and in your family. Because just as Thomas Edison said hundreds of years back, and he said, the doctor of the future will give, will give no medication, but will interest his patients in the care of the human frame diet and the cause and prevention of disease. Now, I don't know if he actually said that. I saw this online. Maybe he did say that, but it's true, right? You got to be empowering your own self as far as health is concerned. And now it's time for our wisdom round, the last round for today, which is sort of like a rapid fire round, four rounds, four questions, so that our listeners can take note and take action. So Minakshi, what is the best piece of advice that you have received? Uh, listen to your body. Take care of yourself, which is very, very important. And once you start listening to your body, your body will tell you where you need to focus more. If you could turn back time, spend one hour with someone who is living or dead, who would it be? Uh, my grandma. She has a she had a huge wisdom about the Ayurveda and the herbs. And unfortunately, I couldn't get that wisdom from her. So definitely she will be the one. What is one thing you do in the morning or evening before you sleep that has improved the quality of your life? The same thing, 
uh, waking up at the Brahma Mahurta and before going to bed uh, nicely, massage my feet and uh, do the Abhyanga if I have a time, the full body. And if I don't have the time, then at least forehead and the feet daily. And also uh, talk to my little one, tell her stories. If you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be? Um, the biography of Yogi. Uh, I love that book because it gives uh, real life knowledge about how the yoga is and uh, how uh, implementing those principles can change one's life. The autobiography of Yogi, yes. So Action Tribe, would you like to receive this book, this audio book for free? Because this is one of our most recommended books. It's 2020, end of this year, as we record this show. And if you've not listened to this book, then this is an opportunity for you to receive this book for free. You don't pay anything. And this is because audible.com is offering all our listeners a free audible credit with a 30 day trial. And I believe because it's the holiday season now, they're giving you two credits, not one, two book credits. So if you want to listen to autobiography of a yogi and some other book as well, then go to my seven chakras.com forward slash free book. That's my seven chakras.com forward slash free book and start listening to your next book. So Meenakshi, thank you so much for joining us today. Before you go, tell us something that you are grateful for and how can we find you online? So first of all, I'm grateful for this opportunity. And uh, definitely I'm grateful for this year um, because of the pandemic. A lot of people, they have lost their life and uh, whoever are healthy and uh, safe, I'm grateful for all the people in the entire world. Um, regarding my practice, one can reach out to me at www.iuroots.com or minakshi at iuroots.com. Uh, I do offer virtual as well as in-person uh, consultation on various health issues related to Ayurveda. And uh, we do offer uh, the Panchakarma also. Uh, and uh, I do also offer the workshops Right now, those are the virtual workshops on the various topics of Ayurveda. And uh, also for the student also, who are part of Ayurveda journey, I offer the mentorship also. So if you want to reach out for any of this, uh, uh, then you can reach out uh, at minakshi at iuroots.com or give us a call at 214-801-1238. And the website is uh, iuroots.com Awesome. We'll have all of these links up in the show notes. Action Tribe, reach out to Minakshi and give her a shout out. Like I said before on Instagram. And a couple of things before we before we wind down. If you like this episode and if you'd like to try out one of our Pranayama Soma Breath Breathwork sessions, then visit my seven chakras.com forward slash breathwork intro. That's my seven chakras.com forward slash breathwork intro. I want everyone to try it out. That's why I've placed it at just 50 cents. Okay. So if you've listened so far, you're a fan of the show, it's clear. So go to my seven chakras.com forward slash breathwork intro. And like I said earlier, have that abhyanga, take that abhyanga, self-massage, choose your oil, do it, have a warm, nice bath after that and tag us on Instagram with your photo. My handle is at my seven chakras, also tag Minakshi at Ayur Roots and we'll share your story with our community. That's how we connect. If you have any feedback, comments, observations, something that you'd like to share, uh, email me at aj at my seven chakras.com, aj at my seven chakras.com and if you would like to support us, leave us a review on iTunes. Okay. So leave us a review on iTunes. That's the best way that you can, you can share and support us and help us grow. So Minakshi, thank you so much for appearing on our show, talking to us about the power and promise of Ayurveda and taking us one step closer to a human revolution. 